Hey everybody, welcome to this presentation. Uh, it's a pretty long one, it's actually more kind of lecture called DNH, Instant Best Friends Forever, and it's all about visualizing electromagnetic fields to help you understand electromagnetic compatibility. Originally, I made this presentation for the IEEE German EMC chapter, but here I have re-recorded them for the YouTube. So let's go, let's get ahead. Obviously, if you want to visualize electromagnetic fields, we have to calculate them. And all electromagnetic phenomena are, of course, described by Maxwell equation, Faraday's law, Ampere's law, Gauss law, and uh, the law of no magnetic monopoles. If you solve them, you can visualize the fields. Obviously, they are coupled partial differential equation. It's not that easy to solve them. And besides solving the Maxwell equations, what you always need to include is obviously the, the media equations. I will stick just to linear media equations, but that's uh, in many cases enough to describe most of the EMC phenomena. So when you look at how electromagnetic field theory is typically uh, teach that people trying to simplify this equation. So in the case of static, like electrostatic and magnetostatic, you can decouple these equations. So you can solve each one separated from the other. However, if you look how typically this um, uh, this uh, questions are set is something like assume an infinite straight wire carrying a certain current. And the first question you have to ask yourself is how did the current actually get there? And it doesn't get there by on its own. Of course, it only gets there by, because it's driven by some electric field. So, if you're looking at the, pra the practical solutions, actually you will always have an electric and a magnetic field. They are not decoupled. <laughs> they tend to be decoupled for uh, for the students to make the calculations easier. But in reality, you will have always the electro, uh, the electric, and the magnetic field at the same time, which leading to why I called it the ENHR uh, best threats, because they are almost there for all time. Uh, so it's obviously pretty difficult to solve Maxwell equations analytically, and that's what the, the numerical solutions came in. And if you want to do numerical solution, we of course need to discretize the Maxwell equations, solving them in certain time steps or solving them on, on, a, on a grid. Let's first start with, the, start with the discretization in terms of the time. So we have this d over dt terms and we have to somehow discretize them. One typical approach is if we uh, choose the the field behavior to be time harmonic with something like uh, amplitude times e over i omega t, then the time derivative becomes simple. It will become like minus i omega in the front. So it's the time derivative simply becomes a multiplication with the i omega, which makes the solving much simpler because then we get these two simplified equations now uh, without the d over dt. And if we modify these equations a little bit, if we put one into the other, then apply some material properties, we end up with a simple equation for the electric field. You see it's decoupled now uh, from the magnetic field. And we have on the right hand side the source current and the electric field we need to solve for. Once we have solved for the electric field, once we have solved the system of equations, we can get the magnetic field again simply by applying this formula. So this is the so-called frequency domain approach, which you typically know from the finite element method. Another approach is obviously instead of uh, taking this, this partial time derivatives and replacing them with, with finite differences. So we replace the time, this, this derivative by using the field at the time step t plus delta t half and t minus delta t half. So we really put, uh, like, let's say, explicit discretization. We, we, we discretize them by using time steps. And if we rearrange the equations, what you get is like the electric and the magnetic field, depending on previous time step. And then you loop over the time, and you obtain the, basically the time behavior of the fields uh, in the whole of your computation. Obviously, it's not only needed to discretize the time, you also need to discretize the space. And there is um, a lot into this, how to discretize the space. Basically, very general, what you need to do, you need to resolve the wavelengths and you need to resolve the material boundaries. I don't go into any any 
details over here that will be too much but you see we have discretized the Maxwell equation depending on which scheme we choose for the time uh, to, to discretize this time derivatives we get a frequency of a time domain formulation which have uh, different properties depending on what kind of um, what kind of problems you would like to solve one or the other might be better but let's let's finish here with the with the theory and let's get to the applications and first of all if we talk about um, fields we also talk about voltages it's a very common way people in electronics describe the behavior describe how how the structure is excited and if we look what what is the voltage actually the voltage if we want to couple the voltage to the fields it's a pass integral over the tangential electric field. So you have separated some charges that create an electric field and integrating the electric field along a path will give you the voltage. But the voltage is actually something which might become quickly misleading. So what I have here is a is a coil. The coil is driven with a certain with a certain current. Around the coil there is such a metallic structure, it's very symmetric, the coil is symmetric, everything is symmetric. And now let's assume we want to measure the voltage between these two blue points. So we put some wires here and at this point a high ohmic resistor and we measure the voltage over the resistor that's pointing from down to up. We get something like 0.6 uh, millivolt, that doesn't matter what is the absolute value. What's important is that the voltage appears during the switching event, obviously that's uh, an that's, uh, uh, induction effect. However, if we now want to measure the voltage between these two points, that's what we are looking for, and we change the site where we put our measurement equipment to, then the sign of the voltage will change completely. So obviously the voltage is not, a, not, not conserved, the voltage is something which might become quickly misleading. I mean, in this case, it's clear because the magnetic, uh, the electric field inside this loop is uh, completely something which is which is induced by the by the magnetic field generated by the coil. So they uh, they will point in different direction at this two ends. However, again, the voltage is not defined by two points. The voltage is defined by the path between two points. And the longer you pass gets, or the higher your frequency you get more likely this pass will play a role and your voltage might behave different so it might become misleading and also that's the reason why you actually don't find the voltage in the Maxwell equation it's a quantity which is derived from the, uh, from the electric field so be careful when using the voltage something which is much more stable let's say which is a conser conservation uh, thing is the, is the current so the current is uh, integrating basically uh, around a loop, integrating the magnetic field around a loop, and this will give you the current there. Uh, you find the current in the Maxwell equation and the curl, um, curl H equals J. So uh, I will not talk about how the current is defined, but I would like to show another, another property of the current, because a very typical thing people that have in mind is that when you have a, a DC current it will spread over the conductor while if you have an AC current it will stay on the outside. So that's that's something that people typically remember. But I would like to ask you what happens in between actually because a DC current is not something that's in the instantaneously there. So I made a very simple setup so it's a three meter long two bars with a three centimeter uh, long uh, 50 ohm resistor, volumetric resistor, so we can see the fields inside. Uh, they have a good conductivity, 1 V7, and we drive it with the voltage here, and the voltage has a 1 nanosecond rise time, it's quickly going up, and then it's hold for 1 microsecond. So if we look now at the current, what it happens is, obviously it starts because the excitation is here, it starts, propagates here, so this is still, this is just 1 nanosecond. Uh, that we see and then it getting from the outside around the conductor and after one nanosecond the current is already clearly distributed all over the conductor and maybe if you have noticed during during the switch on is how does the current actually switch on and people have sometimes a naive thinking think like the current flows to the load and then back from the load and the part of the current flowing back from the load people call return current 
but that's not true. If you have checked carefully how the current has uh, has propagated over the bars, it's obviously not back and forth. It's it's in both conductors at the same time. This is how the current loop will close. So that means basically the naming of the return current, like which which used many times, it's 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 an engineering concept. There is no such thing as return current in the Maxwell equation. So that's I think it's interesting to see this uh, and remember that the return current is is more because of you thinking and not because of the physics. So that's the switch on of the current, but now let's continue what's happened inside the conductor. Now I have the time after the switch off was one nanosecond and now I have the time uh, where the current is, basically the source is switched on for one microsecond. And if we now look at the current, you can see that it's going from the outside of the conductor to the inside. It's slowly diff diffusing into the inner of the conductor and that's not an instant thing which happens that's 980 nanoseconds it took for the current to get to the inside and it's still not evenly distributed so even your curve what you saw is flat the current is not yet dc the current will only become dc after an infinite amount of time that's what dc means um, however we can we can safely say that something like after one millisecond or so it will be distributed well but this here was only one microsecond and obviously the current will not distribute it will take time till the current can diffuse into the inner of the conductor what's interesting then is uh, what happens when we switch off the current actually so this is the next animation i'm at 980 nanoseconds so shortly before switching off which happens at 1000 nanoseconds we have this current which has diffused to the inside and obviously the current once it diffused to the inside it cannot disappear instantly the current is still there the time it takes for the current to get in it will also take to get out and what's very interesting is if you look now what's happening here after the switch off you see that there are like two regions of the current formed inside which are separated from each other so why is that happening if we look at the at the current distribution as we had before, so this is before switch off, we have this one pointing inside, this one pointing outside, and then after switch off, like you could already see in the animation, there are really two regions, and the current is forming a loop inside each of them of this bar separated from each other. Obviously, it cannot disappear immediately; it has to die off due to the losses but it will still form a loop and it will form always the loop along the path of the lowest impedance and in this case because we have this 50 ohm resistor over here the lowest impedance is actually to close the loop inside each separated bar and you can also see it in in this plot so this before the switch off current flowing in a loop like this after the switch off two loops are formed in each of the separate bars i think very interesting effect and again, I said it's because of the 50 ohm resistor. If we put, if we keep a short over here, you can see now it's yellow. It's a short, and the loop will not change even after the switch off, because this will be the loop of the lowest impedance, and this will be how the current will die off due to the losses. So I think it's it's interesting, and you should remember that like the current doesn't change instantly from a AC to a DC behavior. It really takes time uh, by uh, by really diffusion into the conductor so when you look at your currents in the circuit simulator and they look flat don't call them dc they are only dc after a very long time so i think that's quite interesting and to see this kind of behavior to really visualize how the current looks like and we had the voltage we had the current obviously the next thing is the power transfer so if you look at drift velocity of electrons into a metal this is a formula you can get from from wikipedia and the main message is like the drift velocity the speed at which electrons move in in uh, in a good conductor is pretty low so that means that the naive thing thinking like that the electrons will transfer power that cannot be true simply because they are far too slow for what we see. I mean, if you switch on the lights, the, the power will be transferred um, almost instantly. So that's not at this kind of speed, because if you think about the wires like in your living room, it will take far too long. So that's 
I think, pretty common knowledge, but it's good to repeat it and also show the things. Obviously, the power transfer is always by, by the pointing factor. And this happens not only at high frequency. People often associate the pointing vector with just high frequency behavior and antennas and so on. The pointing vector is also valid at low frequencies. It's also valid at DC. And uh, if you integrate the pointing vector over a surface, you get the power, while something which we'll use in the following slides is also the losses. And here I assume only the electric losses. So you can take the conductivity multiplied by the electric field, which gives you the losses. That's uh, what we, I will use on the following slides. But here's my example. So it's a 10 centimeter uh, diameter of a ring again. I put again one volt, simple setup. I have again a 50 ohm resistor here, a volumetric resistor. But now we go down to one hertz, no longer fast switching. How does the fields look like at one hertz? Obviously the electric field is pointing from the one half of the ring to the other and the magnetic field is located around the rings. That's how you would typically um, imagine the fields for such a simple setup. So if we take this electric field and we take the magnetic field, what do we get as a pointing vector? Obviously the pointing vector will be around the wires because the electric field not penetrating from the one to the other. You have a good conductor, electric field cannot penetrate it. So clearly the pointing vector is all around the wires, as you can see here at the load side. And then at the load side, it's pointing inside. Uh, and here is what the losses happen. But all the energy transfer, all the power flow is obviously outside of the wires. There were a lot of discussions about this. Um, but it's clear that's what electromagnetic theory says, that the power flow is always on the outside. What you need the electrons for, you need the electrons to align the current. So um, the current flow, because you have curl H equals J, so the current flow in the, in the wire is still important because it will kind of align new fields around it, but the power itself will be tra uh, transmitted around the fields. And we can see this, um, I mean, there were, I had a lot of discussions about this on LinkedIn and other people were saying, okay, but there is obviously the, the so-called skin effect, so you will find also fields inside the wires, why don't they contribute? Because everything which is inside the conductor has a very different orientation compared to the to the fields outside of the conductor. And what you will see, I mean, this is a skin effect. You can see at one hertz, the pointing vector is much more inside the conductor. Uh, at 100 kilohertz, it's, it's only on the surface of the conductor. But look at the direction. It's always pointing inside. And when you see this pointing inside, that means it's not contributing to the power transfer. It's only contributing to the loss. And how to see the losses, we have to take the electric field and now crank up. I told you like the electric field between the conductors, it cannot penetrate into the conductor. But there still will be an electric field inside the conductor, which is associated with the losses. It's pointing like when you think about the electric field, which was uh, dealing with the power transfer, it's pointing from one half to the other while the electric field inside the conductor is pointing basically along the path of the conductor. And that's what contributes to the losses. And you can also see, because the losses are J is uh, times conductivity times electric field, you can see the ratio in the electric field is the same ratio as the conductivity we had between this 50 ohm section and this, this highly conductive sec section. So that's very consistent and there's basically no way to argue like, uh, but I only measure voltage, I only measure current. The power flow is always outside of the conductive material. Uh, so like we said, it's not inside the conductor. You need still this conductive material to align your fields, to make the power flow around them. So you cannot left them out, otherwise the fields will not align like that. Uh, the pointing vector inside the conductors leads only to the losses. And what's, what's important is that the electric and the magnetic field, they, as we have seen already before in the example, they change really instantly. They, at one point in space, the electric and the magnetic field are instant. So it's not a good idea to talk about something like a, this is the source, like E is the source of H or vice versa. It 
all the things happen instantly, but they do not happen instantly over the whole domain, right? So instantly at one position, this is the dependence on t, on the time, but not instantly in the whole space. This would violate causality, but that's not happening. So this is the dependence, be aware, Maxwell equations always depend on time and on the, on the space vector. And this is why I called here the instant. We had the best friends in the beginning, now they are the instant best friends. Forever sounds nice, but actually it will not be forever, it will be till the lossy end. Once losses kick in, the electric fields will most probably be converted to thermal. Uh, by losses and then maybe it's not forever it's it's over after the losses kicked in okay that's a lot of basic theory let's talk a little bit about shielding because that's what people are interested in in EMC so I put to, to the same ring as we have before and then I'll put it into a, a metal box mm, I measured the electric field on, on top outside on top inside on the left inside, on the left outside, and it's it's pretty obvious. Um, when you want to shield electric field, what you need is a good conductor. So I have a 5 mm thick box with a certain conductivity, and obviously if we look like outside of the box, the electric field is very low, while inside of the box uh, it's... Ah, let's start again. So, um, when there is no box, we have this uh, red line outside, this is inside with no box, this blue line is outside with no box, obviously the distance to the sources are a little bit longer, that's why the outside is a little bit smaller, but this is just because of the distance between these two probes, when we add the box you can see it drops down by several orders of magnitude, so the conductive material very nicely shields the electric field, as we can also see from the plots. So this is without the box electric field pointing from one, one arm to the other, Why with the box it's completely shielded. Typically, the, this is just a little bit of the zoom out, because these arrows will point perpendicular to the conductor, as you would expect. What's important to say, because every time we deal with shielding is that the shield is not only affecting the fields outside of the box, it's also affecting always the fields on the inside of the box. We will see it over the next slides. So a good conductor shields electric field, but there is always the question, what is a good conductor? How far can the conductivity decrease? And that's what I did here. I changed the conductivity and you can see like um, at the very low frequencies, uh, I mean this is 0.001 Siemens per meter is this curve. Uh, it's very, very low, I'm not sure if this is a stable result, but everything else, even at like one Siemens per meter with very low conductivity, at the very low frequencies you still get orders of magnitude compared to the inside to the outside of the box, and then higher frequencies change, because now the, the higher frequency fields, the fields can still penetrate through the conductor. Now, that's exactly the point, you get an interplay of the electric and the magnetic field in this frequency range, and things become a little bit more complex. But still, even if it's a, what's a really not a good conductor with one Siemens per meter, at the very low frequencies, the electric field is still, it's still shielded very well. So what about now the magnetic field? The same box, same conductivity, five millimeter thickness, and H field probes. So red line is this, this probe here, it's inside, uh, without no box, no, the red line is on the inside without the box, the blue one is on the inside with the box. So first of all, like I said already, adding the box, adding a shield will not only change the fields on the outside, it also changes the fields on the inside. You can see like there is an effect that even the fields on the inside are reduced, but obviously not as significant as here when we are on the outside without the boxes, the light green line and outside with the box is this line. So you can see it does some shielding, but it does not, doesn't do any shielding at the low frequencies actually. It does only a shielding uh, starting at some like, let's say, one kilohertz. So what's the, what's the magnetic field doing when we, when, we add a, when we add a conductive material around it? You can clearly see it. At one hertz, the magnetic field can easily 
can completely penetrate the conductive material. So the conductive material has no effect on this low frequency field. While at 100 kilohertz already most of the field on the outside is gone. So this is because the shielding of magnetic field with a conductive material happens mainly due to eddy currents. And we can visualize this eddy currents. And if, uh, I like very much this visualization. You can see here is the current on the loop flowing in this direction while the current on the inside the inside this conductive bo box is pointing in the completely opposite direction. This at 100 kilohertz. And obviously because we have a one loop generating magnetic field and another loop generating magnetic field and they are completely opposite to each other, the magnetic field will cancel out and you will get no magnetic field on the outside. And also on the inside the fields will be changed because now there is a current which is induced in the box and this current also generating a magnetic field. And this you can visualize very nicely here. You can see the current around the box and obviously in, in these areas the current is the highest because it's, where it's the closest to the source. So the box itself has a very strong effect and the induced currents inside the box the basically she, the, they neglect the source current and uh, this leads to the effect that on the outside the shielding, uh, a shielding effect can be seen. And it's strongly dependent on how the current can actually flow inside your, inside your shield. So the geometry of your shield will have a very strong effect of your shielding. Because what I now did is, I took the same box and I cut it. And obviously now the induced currents will look very different because they can no longer close the loop like this. The loop in each of the section, the induced current loop in each of the section which is separated, will look very different and there will be at some point obviously due to the cut there will be a way for the for the fields to penetrate on the outside you can see over here where we have the two currents the, in, in these two sections of the of the shield this will change and it will no longer be as efficient so here is the top so this was the line without the box this is a completely sealed box while here we see the shielding. There is still a little bit of shielding on top here, but it's it, it's really degraded compared to a full box because the geometry, how you induced currents inside the shielding material look like, this governs a lot of your shielding, and that's important to remember. Obviously, on the side, the effect is not as strong. You still get some nice shielding. It's degraded compared to the fall box, but it's it's not as critical as, as over here, obviously, above the hole. So it's a very tiny hole, but due to the change in the current flow, it has a very strong effect on your shielding. So that was conductive material. Obviously, we could use also a permeable material. And if we look now at the magnetic field with a permeable box, um, so that's wrong here, it's not conductivity, it's permeability. The way the permeable material affects the, the magnetic field is very different because it's now no longer frequency dependent. So if we look inside without the box, inside with the box, oh, the fields in the inside become larger, while outside without the box it's this line, and outside with the permeable box it's getting it's getting less. So what the permeable material is doing? it's basically pushing the field to the inside and this is where the fields on the inside of the box they get higher while the fields on the outside are lower and it's kind of let's say duality of the electric and magnetic field with a conductive material the electric field is blocked uh, while the magnetic field at very low frequencies of one hertz can penetrate and with the permeable material the electric field can penetrate through the permeable material, while the magnetic field cannot. It's a little bit unfair because it was just a permeability of 1000, so you can still get some fields on the outside. And it's, it's, it's nice to see this kind of duality, and it's important to understand that they are basically, for the magnetic field at least, there are two, two ways how to shield it. One is the eddy current, as we have seen, we have a, a induction, which points in the opposite direction and is neglecting the field, uh, it's, it's reducing the net field on the outside. The other thing is by using permeable material, which affects the field distribution 
and it's not frequency dependent. So there are two ways how you could shield the magnetic field. Well, for the electric field, it's still pretty simple uh, just by putting it into a conductor. Now we have seen a little a simple box. Let's take these things and, and move on to, to cable shielding. So I have uh, two cables driven by one volt, distance is six millimeters, the cable length is one meter. We measure the electric field over here and I have a pretty high ohmic termination just to see, get a good signal to noise ratio basically in the simulations. And uh, without any shields, as you would expect, the electric field pointing from the one to the other, and it's still somewhere uh, in, in this kind of dome structure above the ground plane, and we get a certain value, which will be our reference value to see different for different shielding strategies. If we now put a, a set like we need a elect, uh, we need a good conductive material to to shield the the electric field. That's what we are looking at, the electric field. I have put very nice, uh, uh, very good conductors around these two wires, but I still don't get any shielding. You can see that with this, what I call signal shielded, each of these wires is shielded separately by a conductor. There is no shielding. It's simple because there is an electric field between these two, and this electric field is basically induced an electric field in the in the separate shields. So you you can imagine like the charges on the separate shield will be also separated and by the separation on the charges inside the field, the electric field will also point to the outside. So we don't get any shielding. Obviously we need to do something and obviously we need to connect these two shields. If we connect these two shields we get an excellent shielding simply because now the charges between these two shields can distribute together, uh, can can be distributed uh, between, basically the charges can travel from one shield to the other because I have connected them on the ends and that's what's leading to a shield. The separate shielding didn't work at all, connecting the shield and the ends is obviously giving you a very nice shielding with this with this highly conductive material. So that brings, you, brings us a step further. If you have such a, obviously this is true for a two-wire system. So if we want to shield a two-wire system, we could also do a different way. Instead of shielding two separately and connecting them, we can put just one big conductor around this two, because then the charges will distribute in here in a way that will still shield the fields to the outside, as, as we can see here. So that's a way some, for example, for high power industrial devices, you will find this kind of things while you will not find that much in, in electrical vehicle. It's interesting why there is a, a approach always to shield all of the wires separately while shielding them at the same time is probably a much better idea and it also not only works for a two-phase, it will also work for a three-phase system. But there's another thing I would like to talk about actually. Up to now it was perfect, so the shields had exactly the same length as the wires had, but in, in reality this will not happen. What will happen is obviously that you need to connect the wires, you need to cut off the shield, the shield cannot be perfect. And that's quite interesting, because now I have taken this, this shield, so the two wires are shielded at the same time, this was working well, but now I strip off the shield, and I strip it off by 5 cm. Remember, that's a 1 meter length, and we are measuring here in the center. But even then, just stripping off 5 cm of the wire, will let you lose like two orders of magnitude in the shielding simply because this fringing fields at the at the ends of the wires they can you know the the ray they they create fields also even even inside here. So that's important also for shielding first of all the geometry of your shield and or even small imperfections of the shield can lead to a very big effect that you can see afterwards like we can see here we lost two orders of magnitude just because of five centimeters a strip off. That's important. That's really important that the deviations from a perfect shield can make a huge difference in the values of the fields you are seeing. And the same, or let's say not the same, uh, yeah, the same what I showed you for the for the electric field is, is true for the magnetic field shielding. So unshielded is now this magenta wire, while single shielded doesn't work as well. If we take these two single shields, connect them, 
we get a nicer shielding. And uh, if we connect, if we shield them together, also the magnetic field will be shielded. And that's you can also see in the currents very nicely the same. Why my argument was you, you need the charge to flow from the one uh, from the one shield to the other. The same holds actually for the current. So if you have separate shield, basically the induced currents loop are separated. You get an induced current loop in here. You get an induced current loop in here. While if you connect the shields, you get one big induced current loop, which is in the opposite direction of your source loop, and that's how it creates the shielding. So, conductive shields around the wire can help to uh, to shield both electric and magnetic field. Uh, well, obviously for the magnetic field, it requires always some frequency dependence. It will not shield a DC current. If you, connect, if you have a separate shield, you need to connect the wires by some very low impedance to make sure that the shield and small deviations from this ideal coverages, they can degrade your shielding a lot. So shields are something for EMC. Another very popular thing for EMC are obviously ferrites. So let's talk a little bit about ferrite simulations. Um, I put a ferrite around the current carrying wire to show, show you some of the effects, but first let's talk about the material, because ferrite materials are pretty complicated typically, so this is a ferrite material 43, they have this kind of names, and I modeled it by, by some divide dispersion, so you can see there is like a peak in the mu double prime around 4 megahertz, it's typical how it looks like, uh, and I have a wire length of 50 centimeters, I drive it with one ampere. And now let's look what the ferrite does. I mean, I, I was telling you, in the case of the box, that a uh, permeable material will stop the magnetic field. But what will happen if we put this permeable material and put it, put it around the wire, like we did in, in the kind of shield? So here is a way how the magnetic field, or here's a plot of the magnetic field, how it will look like when we start bending a ferrite material over it. So here's obviously uh, the same effect as we have seen in the box of the magnetic field is perpendicular to the uh, to the permeable material and it creates kind of shadow region over here where you can say, okay, this material is uh, is shielding the fields over here. But the more round it gets, the more I get around it, then the less shielding effect I see. Well, in the end, when the, when this permeable material is uh, completely concentric to the wire, you see there is no shielding effect at all. And this is because due to, due to the continuity of the tangential fields. So here the fields try to get perpendicular to the, to the surface of the permeable material. However, if it's completely concentric, there is no way for the fields to point perpendicular to it. They, they, they just cannot be aligned in a perpendicular way because they have to stay continuous. So they always stay in this kind of um, curl fashion around the wire. And that means that like uh, you cannot use a ferrite material to shield a wire, it will not reduce it, but obviously it will do something else. It will increase the impedance, right? So what we see on the left hand side are these two bands. It's it's the magnetic field behind the uh, behind this uh, this material, and when there is no shield and there is a, a band of five, so completely concentric, you see the magnetic field is exactly the same. So they do not shield at all, but obviously they increase the impedance a lot. Right, so this is what you know from putting a ferrite will increase the impedance of the wire, and increasing the impedance means you need a much higher power to drive a current. So it's a little bit unfair because I keep the current fixed and it produces always the same field, but I need far more power to drive this particular current because the impedance has increased a lot. And this is what the typical effect actually of a ferrite clamp is. By adding a ferrite clamp around the wire, what you do is you increase the impedance of the of the common mode. Typically, of the it has to be the common mode because it can this one ferrite clamp can only increase the impedance of of, of the current flowing uh, along the wire. So, adding this clamp, I have increased the impedance a lot, and this is how. 
Typically, a ferrite clamp will help. It will increase the impedance of the common mode and will keep your common mode currents away from the wires. But it will not shield the magnetic field. It will still, however, be able to dissipate due to the losses in the ferrite. It will be able to dissipate at higher frequencies. It will be able to dissipate also the fields. So it has a two-fold way. It increases impedance and it does... Uh, um, dissipates the fields but it does not shield any fields. It's something that I found very interesting especially seeing like this round setup where the, where the uh, ferrite is round around the wire that it cannot affect the fields simply due to field continuity. I like this very much. One last thing actually something is also pretty pretty familiar uh, pretty popular in the EMC region are common mode chokes. So I made a common mode choke here and obviously it behaves as you would expect from a common mode choke, so this is my permeability curve. And I have a common mode impedance, which is the green curve, which is much higher than the differential mode impedance, obviously in a certain frequency range. This is typically the operating frequency range for your choke, that's also why you need to, to choose the particular choke depending on the frequencies you are working with. This was happening here, it looks pretty, pretty familiar. But what I would like to point out, because I have seen these things happening a lot in the uh, in, in the simulation of common mode jokes, um, discussing with some of our customers, is that uh, depending on the material type of the common mode choke, the the conductivity of the ferrite material can play a significant role, and that is the mandan zinc ferrite. They have a conductivity up to 10 siemens per meter, even if it doesn't sound much. You can see if I run the same simulation, including just the 10 Siemens per meter, the behavior of the choke is changing a lot. And that's important when you want to simulate your common mode choke, check first what is the ferrite material used. Because obviously when you have a zero conductivity, it's a very ideal case, then we have no skin effect, right? The magnetic field will penetrate here, but for the skin effect, you, you multiply the conductivity and the permeability. And there is, as long as the conductivity is zero, there is no skin effect. While just with a small value of 10 Siemens per meter at 1 megahertz, we are here, you can see that this, um, the field distribution, the magnetic field distribution can change a lot inside the material. And that's something that I would like to point out, because often in, in data sheets of common mode chunks of the material properties, you will not often find this conductivity, while well, it's really important for the, uh, for the distribution of the fields in, inside the material. So ferrites are fun, uh, they behave a little bit complicated, they have a frequency dependence. Obviously I did not go into the nonlinear properties here, uh, that will open a very big another section, but even just the dispersion properties of ferrites can lead to very uh, interesting effects, as we have seen, like that um, the magnetic field or the shielding of magnetic field with ferrites is limited, uh, or is not even present when when it's completely concentric to the source wires. So there are a lot of interesting things with ferrites, but obviously what I always hear is all the ferrites are <laughs> quite expensive. So I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. I uh, get into a lot of topics. I showed you a lot of things, but there is one takeaway you should take from here. Understanding fields is very important for understanding EMC and it explains a lot of the behavior that you see daily in your lab. And if you want to understand, it's always helpful to being able to visualize and that's what the simulation can help you with. So I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for your attention. It's been a longer presentation, but I had a lot of fun creating it and I hope also you had fun listening to it.